just want to add uh, very briefly my comment to neutrality. Uh, basically, I want to quote uh, this very famous proverb of Churchill. Professor, maybe uh, you can correct me if it was not Churchill. Churchill said, uh, neutrality for neutrality, it, it, it is important to understand on which side and which group you are net neutral. So this is important here. Yeah. Neutral on which side? This is quite important. You cannot be politically neutral. There is no political neutrality. Definitely Austria and Switzerland, they do belong uh, politically to, to the West side. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, Finland and, and, and Sweden, they were one of the strongest partners since many years with NATO. A partnership policy with NATO and for, between NATO and Sweden and Finland was a very success story. So again, uh, when it comes to neutrality, there is no political neutrality. And this is quite important to understand in terms of the current situation with Russia. So how much time have we got, if I may ask Mr. Donfrey now, because we are already running 40 minutes late? Maybe we do 40 minutes. Uh -huh. So that means uh, we can uh, conduct this session until 5.30 approximately. With permission of the ambassador. Uh, yeah. so my guess. Because we are... 5.15. 5.15. 5.15. is fine because... Yeah. Okay, so I will, we will plan it like that. We now have uh, at this uh, concluding uh, interactive discussion, as it is announced, the speakers of the morning and the afternoon session, except uh, Mr. Thomas uh, Silberhorn, who uh, introduced the topic Ukraine-Russia uh, war in the morning at the Deutsche Bundestag. Now, the theme of the concluding discussion is about the global implications of that unfortunate uh, armed uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which in effect is also a kind of proxy war between Russia and the Western world on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Altogether, uh, five participants, Ambassador Gordon Bakota, Prime Minister Hrant Bagratian, Professor Ulrich Brückner, and Professor Dragoljub Popovic. So these are four, sorry, I made the mistake in counting. And uh, let me just, to begin, identify some of those basic questions in terms of global implications. And they have already, in one or the other of the presentations in the morning and the afternoon, they have already been uh, partly mentioned. Of course, the big question which was introduced by Mr. Silberhorn at Deutsche Bundestag is what does all of this, this war mean in terms of the United Nations system of collective security. What does it mean for the integrity of that system? Is it still workable under the present circumstances? And we discussed that in detail also in the morning. But that is really a big challenge for the United Nations, also in terms of the credibility of the uh, world organization and of the long-term survival of the organization. Because if situations like this happened also in other contexts, a time may come when member states will begin to distance themselves and to disengage and to think about other forms of organization. One other uh, major uh, global implication is related to the direct and indirect impact of uh, sanctions as a coercive measures in this extremely massive form in which they are now imposed on uh, the aggressor state, namely on uh, Russia. Sanctions are coercive measures. 
according also to the United Nations Charter, but in the United Nations Charter, they are meant only to be imposed, to be used, if there is a decision on the basis of Chapter 7 of the Charter. That is the basis of legality of sanctions as unilateral coercive measures. In uh, the present context, it is uh, totally different because there is no and there can be no United Nations uh, resolution on their use. But as coercive measures, these are not measures in terms of negotiations, these are not diplomatic measures, as coercive measures, forcing uh, and forced upon the other side, they make uh, those countries that impose them also parties to the ongoing war. And that uh, can bring a major destabilization of the global security system. And the other big really big global implication is that in terms of food security. How can one justify that because of these punitive measures, and some in America pride themselves, President Trump did that quite often also vis-a-vis -vis Russia, they pride themselves in having imposed the toughest sanctions ever in the history of international relations in regard to Russia or earlier also in regard to Iran. That was the the language of uh, President Trump. But uh, can one really bear that responsibility uh, to, uh, can one really accept that uh, the people in the uh, developing world will now, that we make them suffer for a certain political cause here in Europe? Third aspect, of course, this will be, third implication is the most serious one. I demonstrated what it means by reference to the wise words of uh, the late John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, these, uh, the wisdom of President Kennedy and his statesmanship seems to be a little bit uh, forgotten. Still, he is held in very high esteem, almost in the sense of pop culture, but one should really pay attention to his analysis and to what he said. And what I mean is the threat of nuclear war. What does happen if you have a conflict that involves a major nuclear power, if uh, uh, other nuclear powers corner that state, and uh, maneuver it into a corner, so to speak, from which there is no way out. This may lead to a desperate reaction. That's what Kennedy described one year after the Cuba Missile Crisis and just a few months before he was assassinated in Dallas. A fourth major implication in terms also of the global system is what all of that means for Europe as a major global player. I remember quite well, 20 years ago, we had a strategic conference in, in China. At that time, the hopes were great in other regions of the world, including China, India, that Europe would emerge as one of the major global players and as one of the cornerstones of a new and more balanced multipolar order. But in the present situation, when uh, Europe now is following, uh, is involved in a conflict in, on the territory of Europe in such a way that the major European country, namely Russia, is totally isolated. A boycott is not only imposed in terms of travel, and in terms of economic uh, uh, transactions, but also in terms of the culture. By the way, this should be of concern to us here also in any ICD meeting. What should we think about it if uh, now it is the European policy to isolate each and everybody uh, who is uh, in the field of art or in the field of sport and in the field of science if he or she does not issue a certain statement with which the European mainstream is satisfied. It's, very, it's not only unfair vis-a-vis -vis those great artists, uh, singers, uh, people of literature or sports people, but it is against European values and uh, it makes, it nullifies 
the role of culture in such a situation. And we, have, we are discussing especially this question, what role cultural diplomacy could play in situations of tension and conflict. But this kind of approach nullifies the role of culture. And also, we must not forget, that's what I hear, there are quite often people, because of their nationality, because of their citizenship, cannot even continue with their studies, do not get scholarships, and so on. What really does have an individual uh, a citizen uh, to do with the uh, politics of uh, his country? So if Europe puts itself into such a situation of isolation on the European or the larger Eurasian continent, let's not forget that's the Eurasian landmass on which we are. It's not another landmass. Uh, I have great doubts whether Europe can ever emerge as this uh, important stabilizing factor and major player in uh, a multipolar system. And the last uh, aspect or last of the major complications I would mention here just initially and very briefly is that unfortunately what is unfolding now is the scheme of a new east-west conflict which is even, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, more consequential in many respects, also in respect to the nuclear threat, than the earlier East-West conflict during the uh, Cold War. And uh, this new division of the globe is, uh, risks to be even much more uh, faithful for the peoples of the world, and at this time, it will be between the Western world under the leadership of the United States and Europe, but only some few other states, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world that is now organizing itself more and more in, uh, organize, in, in, in institutional structures, whether, whether that is BRICS, which is now being enlarged and so on, and several other uh, regional also organizations with global outreach, one could uh, mention here. And this, and that's my uh, last observation concerning this, that brief survey, uh, could well lead to a development which the Russian president, I speak here neutri neutrally, as President Kennedy suggested in his speech, one which should not vilify people, as the Russian president hinted in, in one recent statement, it well could be that uh, the path of uh, uh, Europe with the policies I described could uh, unintentionally lead to a situation in which Europe gradually takes itself out of the global power equation or reduces the importance simply for, or the West reduces its importance and outreach simply for the fact that many countries, and I don't need to mention now the, or some of the great powers and the leading regional powers, think twice about whether they should continue with transactions in the euro or the dollar uh, currency or whether they should continue with certain forms of cooperation and whether it is not wiser for them to focus on uh, their on cooperation within their own realm. In the long term, the unintended consequence may be, and this may be not just the wish of the uh, president of Russia, which he expressed in St. Petersburg, of course it's his wish also, but it may be more than just a wish it may be a new trend in international relations, a new rebalancing of power at the global level, a new form of, uh, to use the term of speaking of Brzezinski, one of the greatest strategic thinkers of the 20th century, a new global realignment, but in a way which those who triggered it partly may not have thought about. And uh, these are some of the questions one might uh, uh, think about now at the end of this day. And I invite the speakers in the order in which uh, they are listed in the program 
uh, to make their own summary, maybe in approximately 10 minutes, if that is manageable. Please, uh, Mr. Uh, the, uh, so, Ambassador uh, Bar. Please, 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 uh, please. Just Mr. if Prime we Minister, follow, please. as oh, you wish. Okay, no. Okay. We just follow the yeah, okay. uh, Ambassador uh, Bakhmut. Thank thanks for this very nice presentation. I, I really do believe there is a chance now to boost multilateralism. It's going to be very interesting whether Russia be on the long run isolated, on the short run actually, in the Security Council. This would be, from my point of view, a very interesting challenge. And now it's an ongoing issue, ongoing situations between some very important countries uh, in India, I mean India, but also cooperation between uh, Russia, Israel, Turkey, Definitely, Turkey is playing a very important role. So we'll see how will it affect India, uh, the Russia position in the, in, in the Security Council. I think there are some traces, maybe not right away, but uh, I think that China will be also very careful in order to be an ally of uh, Russia and the Security Council. So this is the, the, the major issue. It might play a very important role uh, for maybe the final solution of this war. But again, uh, we, we got to sit and wait and use all the opportunities to see whether, uh, uh, what I already mentioned, good cooperation between G7 countries could be translated in G20 cooperation. We'll see what will, what will be happening in the second half of the year and uh, how the other countries, the members of G20, uh, will uh, be focused and treat Russia in this very important format. I'll stop here. Well, first of all, I think that the world is changing. Today morning, I was saying to you that I see some tendency of regionalization. Uh, modern world constructed after the UN chart, after the Second World War. And another most important event happened in 1972 in Helsinki. In the country started to recognize and take the country. But you know, the UN based on the other principles too. Self-determination and the reunion of nations. In fact, UN is a free, free principle. Free, juridical, what to do in this case. And we don't have solutions, standard solutions. For example, in Europe, to so be recognized the independent state of Kosovo based on self-determination. But in the case of China, we are saying that don't touch Taiwan, but Taiwan is China. The name of the country is Chinese Republic. The name of the biggest, bigger country is People Republic of China. You know? And China is saying that, guess what you want from me? I allow them to have their own flag. They are participating in a different events, sport events as a separate, with a separate national team. They are free, they have their own currency. What they do, what the woman do want. If we recognize Taiwan as not part of China, but we have to recognize in this case that it's a, it's a totally independent state. We don't do it. That I cannot understand. In some cases in the world, we have a big mix. A very, very interesting example is Crimea. To my mind, in Crimea, 2014, they have 65% population of Russians. They have 25 percent population of Ukrainians and 10 percent Tatars. Mm -hmm. Russia says it's mine because it was in Russia uh, until 1956. Just given to the Ukraine because Russia and Ukraine they were one country, Soviet Union. Ukraine says it's mine, and Turkey says, well, it's not Russia, but also historically it was ours. <laughs> so then again, uh, then again, to my mind, in 2014, when Crimea was a referendum on self-determination, there was one mistake. Crimean people, they have a, have a right for the self-determination, but the mistake was they were included after that. The country was included in, in the Russia. That's, that's, that's the issue. 
that's creates a problem. Because in this case, you are violating the rights of credits. You know? But then again, how it should be solved? Oh, we need some new principles to understand that. Maybe we have to protect territorial integrity, but we have to absolutely guarantee the autonomy of the people who would like to be self-determinated. And some principles have to be changed, you know? Uh, look to the donors, uh, you know. I recognize that, was, that there was a mistake. There was, do not be a part of Ukraine, but you know, they created big problems on the language issues. And these people, by the statistics, 8.2 million of Ukrainians out of 50 million, they were ethnically Russians. 90% on the eastern part. And I know a lot of, 16 years working in Kiev, I know a lot of people saying that, okay, but we are Russians. We would like to see our protected. I'm not justifying the aggression because what happened with this aggression is a violation of rights. That is for sure. But then, then again, it's a problem, and I see the consequences. Look uh, how South, South Finland and Sweden, the problem of island islands. It is a small group of islands in the Baltic Sea. Hundred percent totally inhabited by Sweden, but it belongs to Finland. And Finland, Finn people, population, they have no right to go there and to be registered. They have no right to change the structure of the of the, the structure of the population. You know. But then again, it's a solution. It is after hundred years of war, starting from 1921, already 101 years. There is a peace in these islands. Well, I have uh, I, I think that the world is going to be changed. And the third remark. Okay, we can isolate Russia. Uh, hoping that in the terms of technology, uh, Russia in five, ten years will be, let's say, nothing. First of all, it's hard to believe that it's going to happen. Second, the Russians and Soviet Union, they were able to create great means of new weapons. You know, we have to understand. And the fourth, who is sacrificing? It's not Russia, it's not Europe, it's not even Ukrainian government, it is Ukrainian people. I know how many have been killed. I know, I know, I already have a good friend, so professor just being killed, he was sleeping in his house during, during the night. That's also an issue. What to do with that? We are saying now up to the uh, 70,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed, 150,000 wounded, several hundred thousand of population killed, if the statistics is correct, you know, you are, you are talking about of millions of people. Well, I don't know, I don't know what type of, uh, Door should be open for Russia in order to make pressure more acceptable, more salty. Russia is, is an interesting country. They don't have a soft policy. They have an old time hard policy. They didn't learn this soft policy and the advantage of this soft policy now. Well, my, my position as a scientist, as an intellectual, as a human being who was many, many years living in Ukraine also, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, they, uh, sh something should be done to, to save these people, you know, to save these people. I'm not going to say about the solutions, i just share with you my views. Well, and uh, I hope, I hope, I, I hope the behavior, the approach should be changed in order to find something better for the people. Professor Bruckner, please. Professor Krugner talked more than everybody else, so I think I'd rather save some time for a question. Okay. Thank you. Please. Uh, well, uh, the world is based on principles. I agree to that. And one of the principles is the self-determination of nations. 
but sometimes the principles are in trouble and we are facing such a situation with the Ukrainian war. I agree to the self-determination of nations, of course, as everyone else uh, here. But we are in a, the world is in a situation which resembles the one when Kissinger was uh, soliciting President Nixon. He advised Nixon to sacrifice the principle, to recognize the de facto government of China, which lasted for decades, as the legitimate one. Whereas the legitimate government of China was the one residing in Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek was legitimate and his successors. They had to flee because uh, of the power, uh, the force that uh, made them go to Taiwan. And that is exactly the situation, or not exactly, but very likely, the situation we are facing now. Uh, the question is whether Russia will remain uh, isolated. If you ask me, there will be a new Cold War. It has already started. I show, uh, Russia will remain uh, isolated to some extent, to a considerable extent. Uh, but Putin wants to negotiate on only one single topic, geostrategic uh, di division of power and uh, uh, zones of influence throughout the world. So where there will inevitably be some buffer zones of neutral states or whatever the, the outcome of the negotiations may be. At the same time, the Western countries do not want to treat that subject based on the principle, which is also legitimate, which is uh, valuable indeed. Therefore, we'll have to wait. The situation will increase. The situation will uh, become worse. And uh, the most intriguing thing for me is how to end the the exchange of fire in Ukraine. I cannot imagine that to happen without some uh, arrangement behind the scene. Uh, the arrangement behind the scene may look like one uh, 1973. There must have been some arrangement. As you remember, the Arabs attacked uh, to regain uh, territories that had been lost, but Israel reacted, responded, and in a few days, the Israeli army was on the Nile. However, uh, Israel withdrew the army, and it was, at the end of the day, the victory of the Arab countries. Something, some scenario of the kind might apply to Ukraine, some offensive of the Ukrainian troops, uh, a little bit uh, of seeding of the Russians, but it is hardly imaginable at the moment. Therefore, uh, and to sum up, I think the Cold War has already, the Second Cold War has already begun. Russia will remain isolated to a considerable extent. Russia, uh, as I said in the morning session, uh, the Russian population can, is, uh, can endure more than the Western population, but Europe and America will be in the position to develop their technology, and they will do that. As for the uh, Russian technology, it is backward, and uh, either Russia will become some sort of technological colony of China, or they will try to make a peaceful arrangement with the West. Thank you. Now we have got time for the comments and questions that have not been asked yet. Who would like to update? Uh, please, madam. And can you identify yourself, please? Yes, uh, I'm Sahar Baruti. I'm from uh, joining the conference of ICB. Uh, I'm originally Palestinian. 
And I would like to thank uh, all of you for the uh, incredible uh, information you have provided. And mentioning the human uh, catastrophe that's going on in Ukraine, that is my only concern that we have in this, uh, and all the media is talking about uh, effect of the war on the economy, on the, uh, but we, there are people are killed in, in Ukraine. And my concern, and I mean, correct me if I'm out of context, the only thing that you see Zelensky that is asking for more arms and arms and guns. And giving a conventional guns to uh, face uh, uh, an enemy that he has a uh, nuclear weapon. I think my uh, devil advocate as to be, you know, there is a mutual uh, latent uh, concession or uh, agreement nobody knows about or maybe if you can clarify this for me, this only is the like a gun dealer asking for more guns and guns and we're giving him and people are killed. And no way he will defeat uh, uh, Russia with, the, with such a uh, gun gun. So I think it's a very yani, complicated uh, situation, needs to be understood. Is the West going to give, to, to give guns forever for uh, Zelensky? And he will not gain anything, I think, in the, at the end, without any political pressure. Is that true or not? I don't know. I need clarification. So who would like to answer? Oh, yeah, we collect and then, yeah, final answers. So please, who else would like to? If there is one here and one here. Ladies first, you can Yeah. Um, so good evening. Um, I just was uh, like a very interested knowing because there was some very interesting points made, especially about how the Western model of democracy is based on listening. So I want to know, so I come from India and uh, some of my friends are here from Africa as well. So uh, when it comes to the kind of involvement that Europe has had with India and uh, some of the other Asian countries, it's been like I think very less. Um, especially talking about the European Economic Community, in which India was the first, uh, one of the first partners, right, in the 1960s. But till now, our relationship has been limited only to trade. And uh, why India is not really taking a stance as of now is because we have very good relations with uh, Moscow from a, for a very long time, and Moscow has, you know, been able to form such relations, even with China's involvement in a lot of, uh, you know, countries. So, uh, how do you? How do you think we can improve these relationships when it comes to you know, like the ties with Europe and Asian countries? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, third question. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Scott Frederick and I'm also an old student from the ICD. And I just want to say first and foremost that um, it is unfortunate um, what is really um, happening in Ukraine at the moment. But in my country, we have a wise saying, we say, when you point a finger at somebody, the rest of the finger is pointing back at you. And we see how um, everybody is bashing or kind of attacking the invasion that Russia is currently um, having on Ukraine, which is bad. Um, no matter how you want to look at it, it's not the right way they have to go about things. But also, when we talk about the Union, that is NATO, which is also um, day in, day out, or as time goes on, um, having more members, and also trying to create a Union which is so powerful to protect each other, including a nation which is also not directly in Europe, which is the United States of America, uh, connected to the NATO directly. Um, I mean, I stand to be corrected, but all I'm saying is that uh, there has been some invasions as well that the NATO has been part of. The most current one that I would like to use as a reference point to my submission is the one that happened at um, Libya in 2011, where the NATO collaborated with the people who claim being oppressed by the then president to be overthrown. And this has really affected 
the region badly up to today. There has not been any um, reparations made in Libya till today. I come from West Africa. Back then, people from um, West Africa and other African countries traveled to Libya for greener pastures like we do today when we come to European countries. The economy was um, a force to reckon with when it comes to the um, African region. And today, you, you can talk about Libya the same way after Gaddafi was gone. So all I'm saying is that there have been also several ways that invasion or forceful invasions has been taking place with the NATO uh, in regions which doesn't belong or is not part of their connection when it comes to the European Union. And therefore, uh, I'm saying, uh, my question basically is that um, I'm wondering if the NATO or the European Union then considers Libya as a sovereign state who is supposed to deal with their issues by themselves and therefore forcing its way through by collaborating with the people in the said country to fight and overthrow a president and put a nation in such a destructive way till today is also something that we can talk about or talk against with, um, as a disadvantage or something minus that the NATO has been part of. But nobody talks about it. It's as if it never came to play, it's as if it never happened, and everybody is talking about the one thing that is happening today. And this is just one example. There have been several that I'm not here to talk about, but I'm just giving one example directly about this particular uh, incident. And this is all I got, so thank you. Thank you. And by this, uh, we conclude the uh, statements uh, or, and questions uh, from the audience. Who from uh, the panel would like to respond? We had essentially three issues. First, what is the rationale of these ongoing uh, arms shipments from Europe and the US to Ukraine, should that go on indefinitely? What is really the, the, what sense can one make of that? The second was the question about the relations between India and Europe, in particular the European Union. What could be done to make them closer? And the third one is of course directly challenging the NATO uh, double standards and has given us uh, the facts about that, in particular illustrated by the NATO invasion of Libya. And uh, you mentioned this question of uh, legitimacy of NATO's out of area operations when a military alliance operates outside the territory of uh, its uh, member states in a contravention to the uh, North Atlantic Treaty. Who would, uh, from among the speakers, would like to respond to any of the three questions? I think the second one is mainly your competence. I still take the weapon question from my friend from Bahrain. You're welcome. <clears throat> and of course, whenever talking heads on television try to make sense of something. This is, in a lot of cases, speculation, because if you get questions like, what is Putin thinking? Who can answer this except Putin? And even this can be questioned to a certain extent, because he's recalculating on the basis of available data, or how he feels, or like we all do. So my humble interpretation of this delivery of weapons is the West ruled out to fight on behalf of Ukraine because Ukraine doesn't belong to anything as a follow-up to my answer with the buffer zones and neutral countries. So the second best thing that could be done is if a country chooses to opt for self-defense is to equip them with the military means to defend itself. And this is what's happening at the moment on the assumption that there are different qualities of a conventional war and a nuclear war. What we've seen in the past is whenever Putin was fighting a war and he faced problems, then he escalated. 
So I wouldn't rule out that this leads to something like a tactical use of nukes, because in his understanding of the West, we are wimps, we are post-heroic, we are saturated, we don't know what to fight for because we don't believe anything, we are secular and nihilist, so not really an enemy, except that we have many more nukes than he does, and so he doesn't take the risk of escalating the situation at this point when he believes that Ukraine is just a construction and doesn't deserve to survive and it should become something else. On a different note, I also don't think that Putin is threatened by NATO. I think Putin is threatened in this existential threat that he mentioned by the European Union. Because when we look at the socioeconomic performance of Poland and Ukraine when the wall came down, they were on equal terms. If you compare Poland and Ukraine on the 24th of February this year, Poland is four times richer. So if there's something like a beauty contest going on between the real Russia and the anti-Russia, as he puts it, like Ukraine, sponsored by the West, then there is something to fear, similar to what the totalitarian government of the GDR had to fear when people watched the Western development on the other Germany on television or hear from retirees who got a chance to travel and came back with splendid stories of the fifth story of the KDV or whatever else stood for the superior development of West Germany. So if Ukraine continues to perform so much better than what an authoritarian system in Russia can provide, then this is the actual fear because people will start to compare and they don't compare with Bahrain or Portugal or Berlin, they compare with something that they find is comparable. And so bombing them back to a state where they can't win a beauty contest makes the only sense of a war like this, because given that it's the largest territory in the world as a state, why would they need a chunk of Donbass? That makes no sense at all. So I don't know if that gives an answer to the two qualities, if there is a chance to escalate, but basically he wants to live and he doesn't want to risk what happened with so many regional conflicts that they get out of control and became something much bigger than a regional conflict. Thank you. Any other of the colleagues would like to respond to the questions? If that is not the case, <laughs> we will conclude the session. We are already over time. I thank the speakers most cordially for their contributions and the audience for the lively debate. And that ends uh, this day of uh, the World Forum on Democracy and Peace. Thank you and have a nice evening.